This should be played at high volume, preferably in a residential area. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. One, two, three. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's Thursday night. It's 8 p.m. and you are welcome to the Master Edition on Facebook Live. I'm your co-host, Tracy, and together with Joe, we'll be bringing you our regular segments and the usual fun and games. Next to that, we'll also be joined by a special guest, Laura from Pika Broad Beer. Stay tuned. Yay! Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Maastricht Edition. Here we are again. Hi, Trace. How are you Hi. doing? I'm back. I'm well, thank you. Nice to see you again. <laughs> and you too. And I tell you what, I'm loving the scarf. It looks very festive. Oh, look. I know. You know what? I think it's it's not quite December, but it's getting there and it's time to get out the festive vibes, don't you think? <laughs> well, do you know what? If last year is anything to go by, uh, people are starting Christmas early, I think. You know, I, I think, think it's, it's yeah, because... Uh, <laughs> I remember last year, everybody was like, oh, my God, we need to celebrate early. We need to party early. And yeah, we don't know what yeah. Christmas is going to be like. And, yeah, and, uh, yeah I've, uh, I've noticed uh, I, I've only been out a couple of times. But when I've been out, the, I've seen in people's houses that there are sparkly lights already. Indeedy. In fact, uh, Dave and I are planning to make a visit to the Intratown uh, Christmas uh, display this weekend for a little bit of inspiration. We're thinking about trying to do an alternative Christmas tree this year. And so we might oh. just get we might just buy one of those fake ones that look really real. Or we might go for something kind of very funky and Scandinavian kind of little bits of wood put together and stuff. I don't know, we're going to check it out because we've had a real tree for the last couple of years and we plant the real tree outside in the garden, on our patio garden afterwards and the birds love it. They snuggle in there and everything. And so this year we were thinking, do we want to have a third Christmas tree out on the patio? It's not the biggest patio in the world. Right. Or, should try, or should we try something else? So we're going to have a look and see what we can find and uh, it's always nice. I have to admit, and I'm not ashamed to say it, but I have listened to a couple of Christmas carols in the last week. Ooh. Oh, yeah, it's starting early. Well, I tell you what, I went to um, I went to Hornbuck today. Oh. I went to buy a tap. Oh, oh, the excitement of it all. Ooh. Yeah, that, that, that's as exciting as my life is at the moment. But I have to tell you this: when I walked in, I was confronted by an inflatable. Um, well, it was a cross between Father Christmas, a snowman, and a Christmas tree, all rolled into one. Good it Lord. was, ex I know, it was very scary. Um, and yes, it's this big inflatable, 150 euros. Uh, <gasps> uh, uh, yeah, um, so oh, <laughs> now if you're interested in that, of course, Tracy, you just give it a couple of pumps and it's up. Oh, God, that doesn't sound very environmentally friendly at all. And I'll I'll skip over that comment and move on, Joe. <laughs> now, we're going to see what we do. We might find some sort of Christmas tree alternative, but it's nice to have a look around and soak up the vibe a little bit. God only knows what kind of Christmas we are going to have. So we might as well get in there now, right? Oh, I, I don't even want to think about it. But what about the city centre of Maastricht? I mean, uh, how is that looking? Well, they've, um, as ever, they've been nice and ahead of time. They've got, I think, pretty much all of the Christmas lights up now. And I must say, as usual, I mean, it looks very beautiful. They've got the little sort of hanging displays between yeah, yeah. the streets. And at the Onzeli, the Rauklein, the, the big giant balls are back again in the trees above the square. And it's all very lovely. Um, there was a big truck around today, I think maybe doing some finishing touches, but it does look like Maastricht in terms of lights is ready for the festive season, Joe. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as long as Maastricht is ready, I don't know about the rest of us. God knows how it's going to turn out, as you say. But uh, well, can I tell you something that's happening tomorrow mm. on a completely different tangent? Tomorrow is World Toilet Day. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, I was going to repeat Adam's comment, but I don't think it's broadcastable. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> oh, yes, Adam sent us a little comment earlier. But yeah, we won't, we won't go there. Uh, but um, now, to be fair, um, the, the point of World Toilet Day, um, this is a UN initiative, and it's actually to highlight, actually, mm -hmm. the bad sanitation that you do find in certain areas of the world. 
However, it got me thinking because, of course, uh, for many of us, we do take um, uh, the toilet or the flush toilet for granted. Mm. I thought I might mm. run by a few things with you, Tracy. You might be surprised about this. Wow. <laughs> a brief history of the flush toilet. Well, how did I'm so glad that I, I picked this week to be here uh, <laughs> and return. Go so, for it. Go. I'm well, all it's here. unclear who first invented the flush toilet. Um, there's been some archaeological excavations in northwest India that's revealed 4,000-year-old drainage systems, which huh? may have been toilets, um, mm -hmm. but it's not clear whether this is uh, genuinely the case. However, uh, the honour of producing the first toilet goes to either the Scots because right. there was a Neolithic settlement dating back to 3000 BC, um, or to the Greeks who constructed the palace of uh, Knossos in um, 1700 BC. Um, they had these large earthenware pans that were connected to a flushing water supply. Ah. Uh, that's quite a long time ago, because no, we've always thought it was the Romans, you know, who... Well, they, invent, uh, they invented almost everything else, so you would assume yeah, they well, did that too. <laughs> Well, considering, the, I mean, the Greeks, they're talking about 1700 BC. It's actually 315 AD that Rome um, went for it with the toilets. They had 144 public toilets. Wow. And the Romans treated going to the toilet as a social event. So oh, great. They would sit around, they would meet friends, they would exchange views, get uh, catch up on the news. Um and they would wipe themselves with a piece of sponge that was fixed to a like a, a short wooden handle. And then this was rinsed in a, in a water channel, um, which ran in front of the toilet, and it was reused. Good Lord, kind of like one of those things you use in the bath now, those sponges on the end of a stick. Exactly, exactly. Good so, Lord. Um, and it's been suggested that actually this is where the saying came, um, getting hold of the wrong end of the stick. <gasps> that could be, because these sayings all come from somewhere. Yeah. That, and I tell you, that is not one stick you'd want to get the wrong end of. You certainly don't. You certainly don't. Mm. Now, let's uh, uh, come forward to medieval times. Mm. Uh, people used to use potties. So oh, they would yes. just simply throw their contents through the door or window into the street. Um, now, posher people would have um, a, a, a garderobe, which was a, a protruding room with an opening for waste, which was suspended over the moat that was around their, their property. So they would basically be hanging out <laughs> of the window, covered in and do what they've got to do. And it would just... Oh, God, it doesn't bear thinking about, does it? I no, mean, it yeah. doesn't. I, I will not think about it. Uh, <laughs> just pushing it through. <laughs> yeah. It. Oh, gosh. So wow. they, these were um, um, eventually replaced by the commode, which is a box with a seat and a lid covering uh, a porcelain or copper pot. To, to, to catch the, the, the waste. Mm. Um, apparently, uh, Louis VI of France had his commode behind curtains, while Elizabeth I covered hers in crimson velvet and lace, uh, oh, using lovely. sprigs of herbs to disguise the odours. Oh, well, th there you are. Needs must, I guess. <laughs> and it's widely, uh, it's a widely held belief that Thomas, <laughs> wait for it, Thomas Crapper, Hmm. designed the first flush toilet in, uh, in the 1860s, but it was actually 300 years earlier during the 16th century that Europe discovered modern sanitation. And the credit for inventing the flush toilet goes to Sir John Harrington, who is the godson of Elizabeth I. Okay. Um, he invented the, the first water closet with a raised cistern with a small downpipe through which water ran to flush the waste away in 1592. So um, he built one for him for himself and one for his godmother. Um, oh, but nice. the, I know, but the the invention was ignored for like two hundred years. It wasn't until seventeen seventy five that Alexander Cummings, a watchmaker, developed the S shaped pipe under the toilet basin to keep out the foul odors. That's what it's for. There we go. I know. And there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's lots more. I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'm going to be here all night. It's very very interesting. <laughs> 
Who, wow. would, have so Who would have known? But I tell you, it's one thing I, I have to recall a time when Dave and I were traveling in China and uh, it was quite commonplace for there not to be a flushing loo like we might be used to over here. And it yeah, was yeah. a sort of kind of a hole in the ground and a, yeah. a squat situation. Yeah. And that was quite um, challenging. Yes. And then while in Japan, you have a whole other side of the scale where you've got these robotic toilets that kind of almost talk to you and they have different programs and they have different colors and they they self clean and it's a complete it's like a spaceship so completely something else entirely so uh there you go so people dear people while well, next time you go to the loo have a think about it and uh <laughs> ponder, oh. ponder this <laughs> <laughs> maybe well, I was going to say maybe we should ask our, our our listeners or viewers tell us what do you do on the toilet because people often read of course some people do and read some some people are on their telephones on their telephones now I mm -hmm. mean if you get a video call come through while you're on the loo that's not good <laughs> yeah, yeah. accept with caution I would say but yeah, exactly. Indeed, I'm sure there's some sort of report out there that explains uh, which different type of people like to read and do this and that while on the toilet. So um, I suppose it depends how long you're going to be there, really, doesn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So maybe yeah. think about this tomorrow on the world toilet. <laughs> so there you go. We, we do like to inform here. Now, speaking of informing you, we would probably like to tell you about the book of the week from the English bookstore here in Maastricht. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah? Book of the week. Book of the week, 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 book of the week. Ah, oh, perfect. That's what it is. With your singing and my dancing, honestly, the world is our lobster. <laughs> A little drum action. What is the book of the week, Joe? Well, the book of the week, thanks to Kirsty from the English bookstore in Maastricht, Love. Love is it. Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Ooh. Yuval Noah Harari. Now, this is one of those non-fiction books that tackles big ideas and histories in a very accessible, readable kind of way. The, uh, the, the author, um, I shall say the name again, Professor Yuval Noah Harari, um, he's got a, a PhD in, uh, in history from the University of Oxford, Oxford and, uh, and lectures in world history. So mm. in Sapiens, um, Harari takes the reader on a daring journey through human history, specifically the history of Homo sapiens, from um, ape-like creatures to who we are today. Um, and it's broken into sections. Um, so they cover um, cognitive growth, the effects of agriculture, um, the influence of money, religion and science. Um, and it speculates um, where we're headed, if you like. So for, for such grand topics, it's, it reads quickly. Mm. Um, and it holds your interest, which is good. Uh -huh. uh, Chris Evans called it jaw-dropping. Bill Gates said it's so provocative and raises so many questions about human history that I knew it would speak great conversations around the dinner table. Well, Ooh. if only we were having dinner with other people. Huh. Well, there you go. Between the stories about toilets and sapiens, that would be a fun dinner. Well, there, yeah. Do you know what? I think that that could be a series of dinners, to be honest with you. Um, Obama has described it as a sweeping history of the human race from 14,000 feet. Um, it talks about some core cool things that have allowed us to build this extraordinary civilization that we take for granted. So, um, that's yeah. one for the Christ That's one for under the Christmas tree this uh, this I year, think right? So. Mm. I think so. So. Um, Pop along to the English bookstore in Maastricht. Yes. Um, if you now, for those of you who have already read it, actually there is um, a follow-up. It's called uh, Homo Deus: A Brief History of Tomorrow. So, twenty-one lessons for the twenty-first century, apparently, also a bestseller. So, uh, um, worth having a look at that as well. But yes, Kirsty Down okay. at the English bookstore in Maastricht says, pop along. They've got um, a few copies of Sapiens, a brief, brief history of humankind. 
worth having a look. Sounds very interesting, Trace. Very nice. I it's lovely. Lovely to get these book recommendations. And yes. I like I like the fact that um Kirsty is also choosing a, a broad spectrum of options, which can appeal to every kind of reader, which is also very nice. So uh but yes. this one uh, I, I already have in mind someone who might like this for Christmas. So uh I may be popping along with Frank and Strad myself to uh pop Good into idea. the lovely English bookstore. Very nice. Now, speaking of uh, broad options, uh, we have the lovely Christina from Maastricht now. She's going to be mm. talking about all the things that we could be getting up to safely over the coming week. Hopefully. <laughs> I am so pleased that the new measures have included keeping the theatres open and there's still lots of performances for you to enjoy. So we're going to concentrate on those. Friday the 19th of November, again back in Herla, we have an unusual collaboration. These guys have a 48 year age difference. <laughs> so we have New Yorker Gary Lucas He's a guitarist performing with 22-year-old Dutch folk singer and double bass player, Peter Willems. They collaborate and the style is called psychedelic blues and folk jazz. And they have some pieces of their own and some pieces by say, Jess Buckley. Sounds lovely. Have a listen now. Oh, it could be a spoonful of diamonds. Oh, it could be a spoonful of gold. Oh, it could be. Also, Friday the 19th, this time in Liege. This sounds super cool, super unusual. It's called Return of the Piano Bar, and there's pianist Johan Dupont and David Sikivi, who is the singer. And they're just taking your requests. It can be movie soundtracks, it can be songs, any genre. And they have to play it kind of like a live karaoke jukebox type thing. And you can also go and sing with them. I mean, I would be up for that. But <laughs> Saturday the 20th in the Theatre and Hit Freitoff in Maastricht. There's a dance performance created by a club guy and Ronnie and performed by the Slagwerk Company in Den Haag. It's the story of a man who was innocently imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay for 14 years, obviously tortured, interrogated throughout that time. Um, the performance looks very, it looks quite heavy and quite intense. Um, but also obviously very moving one to really make you think. Also Saturday the 20th, also in the theatre and had fright of, but a different location, Dutch American singer songwriter, Laura Janssen. She's accompanied by herself on a piano in a concert called We Saw a Light. She has been described as a great storyteller. And from what I've heard, she has a very lovely voice to tell her story. Back to Herla on Saturday the 20th, a blues concert with Kay Waters and Robert Ducat, both American singer-songwriters, both playing the guitar and singing. Sounds very cool, very bluesy. I'll just let you listen. Sunday the 21st in Herla, British 70s band 10cc are performing. I find this quite exciting. <laughs> uh, if you remember, well, the hit I remember is I'm not in love. Check that out, that should be that should be quite cool. <laughs> Also Sunday the 21st at the Music Hitterei in Maastricht. I have to mention this because it's such a brilliant cover name. Still Collins, a cover band for Phil Collins. <laughs> uh, all those hits you remember and he's got a voice very similar to Phil Collins.
lastly, I'd like to mention in the Lumiere Cinema a film called Rivoluzzi. It's not in English and there's no English subtitles. It's completely in Dutch, but it's filmed completely in Maastricht and the surrounding areas, which is lovely to watch. You'll recognise loads of places there from around town. So if your Dutch is good enough, check it out. It's described as a dystopian comedy set in the year 2040. And I make a tiny cameo in it. <laughs> That's not the only reason it is a very good film as well. And obviously beautifully shot. That's all. Enjoy your week. Go and watch things. Please go and watch things. Let's keep the theatres open. Okay, bye. Oh, thanks, Christina. Lovely stuff. What a great mix of things going on. But, of course, mm -hmm. as with all of these events, do check beforehand exactly yeah. what is going on. Because, of course, some of these events are getting cancelled, including the event that Christina was supposed to be at tonight. Because the lovely Christina, her real job, if you like, is usually singing with our lovely Andre Ryu. But... It got cancelled this evening. Well, well, it got cancelled. Uh, he decided to to pull out, so to cancel mm. the event. Uh, also, there was a one in Vienna, I believe, that was cancelled. But here in Maastricht at the Mech in December, indeed, he he decided it would be kind of irresponsible, really, to have so many people together. So it's been postponed, actually, not cancelled, yeah. but. Postponed to, this, uh, fine, yes. to December 2022. And in fact, uh, speaking about things like this, I mean, this time of the year, um, I would have bring in, been bringing you a small update about Christmas markets, which is also something that would be yes. started this, this weekend. But um, as it stands, it does seem that some markets might go ahead, some are already built but may not open and some have mm -hmm. been cancelled completely um so i'm i'm gonna hold that one over and hopefully next week when things are a little bit maybe mm. more certain and, and established we can find out i know here in maastricht the normal winter wonderland is not going ahead there's going to be a sort of smaller version um yeah. going on um i know in germany some of the markets I think they're still planned to happen, but some indeed are not going to go ahead. So that's also having an impact as well, sadly. So it's uh, a bit of a shame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's a bit of a, a fluid situation, as they would say. Mm, so I think it is. Stay, just stay tuned, watch social media, check online, inform yourself and just be prepared in advance. So you don't go somewhere and find out that, you, you know, yeah. it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be tragic. It would be tragic, but uh, but if all of these uh, events that Christina was talking about are going to be going ahead, there's a really nice mix of things going on, including mm. the wonderful 10cc that are going to be uh, playing at the weekend. One of my firm favourites, they're going to be in uh, Heerlen. Um, but, of course, before we get to the weekend, we, we need an opportunity to maybe sort of relax a little bit, Tracy, oh, yeah. you know? I think so. After, yeah. all, after all, all that depressing talk, Joe, you need to cheer us up with a little bit of fun historical uh, facts, I believe. Well, do you know what? If this is one of those programmes where we're either talking about toilets or we're talking about patents or we're talking about, uh, well, uh, do you know what? Let's get to uh, it. Yeah. Yeah, let's get put on our feet it. up. <laughs> let's put get our feet up. Let's let's get on with it. Stop talking. Um, relax. Have a cup of tea because it is time for This <laughs> Day in <laughs> History. <laughs> Oh, the excitement yes, difference. Yes, I know. We're going to, for December, I suggest we try and do the theme song to a Christmas carol each week. Pick a different Christmas carol, you know? Like, oh, I love your ideas, Tracy. We, we, need, we need some, um, uh, some reindeer bells in, in, in the background, we don't we? do! I think I've got something somewhere. Oh, why? Be in my big mouth. <laughs> yeah, ca carry on. <laughs> And don't forget, people, coming up uh, after the news, we're going to have Laura from uh, Pika Broadbeer coming on uh, very yes. soon. So uh, we have uh, we have that to look forward to as well. But in the meantime, it is Thursday, the 18th of November, 2021. And on this day in 1497, which was a few years ago, the Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama reaches the Cape of Good Hope. 
And I was wondering what the weather would have been like then in 1497 at this time of year. I'd like to think it was uh, um, maybe a little nicer than it's been here the last few days because, oh my God, it's been gloomy. It has been a tad gloomy, hasn't it? Isn't it kind of that gloomy, grey, dark? It's been gloom on top of gloom. We, we need a little sunshine. Yes, and that's that's a lot of gloom, Tracy. In 1805, on this very day, um, we've got a lot of wi- girly stuff coming up. So we've got, in 1805, 30 women meet at Mrs. Silas Lee's home in Wiscasset in Maine, and they organise a female charitable society. It's the first women's club in the whole of the US. Wow. Now, a few years later, in 1872, suffragette Susan B. Anthony is arrested by a US Deputy Marshal and charged with illegally voting. <gasps> Sticking with the girls, two years later, in 1874, the National Women's Christian Temperance Union is organised in Cleveland. The sisters are doing it for themselves, I tell you. They're so all coming a, together. A big day now, in history. <laughs> it is a big day. Um, in 1883, on this uh, 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 this very day, standard time zones are formed, and this is by the railroads in the US and Canada. That's how the time zones actually started, because of the railroads, so that they could actually get synchronised from state oh, to state. Okay. Mm. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 1902, on this very day, Brooklyn toy maker Morris Mitchton names the teddy bear after US President Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, yes. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I knew you'd get all gooey. I do. On this day in 1913, Lincoln Deachy becomes the first American pilot to perform an aircraft loop the loop in his Curtis airplane near San Diego. I have to say, it's not something I fancy. Knowing what my tummy's like, it probably wouldn't be very pretty. (laughs) 1918, on this very day, Latvia declares independence from Russia. And in Uh 1926, George Bernard Shaw accepts the Nobel Prize for Literature, but refuses the prize money, (laughs) saying, I can forgive Alfred Nobel for inventing dynamite, but only a fiend in human form could have invented the Nobel Prize. (gasps) Take that and smoke it, as they say. Absolutely. In 1928, on this day, Walt Disney's Steamboat Willie is released. It's the first Mickey Mouse sound cartoon, which suggests that it's Mickey Mouse's birthday today, actually. Ooh, I wonder if that made the news today. Ooh. Oh! <laughs> 1956, Morocco gains independence. And on this day, 1992, Malcolm X's film, directed by uh, Spike Lee, starring Denzel Washington and Angela Bassett, is released in the U.S., uh-huh. In 1993, black and white leaders in South Africa approved new democratic constitution. And in 1997, Willem de Kooning painting Two Standing Women sold for $4,182,500. Wow. A few years later, in 2003, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court rules the state's ban on same-sex marriages is unconstitutional. Uh-huh. Now, I wonder if you remember this. In 2015, Kangaroo Dundee, a wildlife TV series, premieres featuring Brolga and Roger, the ripped kangaroo. Do you remember seeing those pictures? I do remember seeing them. And I, I, I fear that that kind of took a dark turn at one point because wasn't there a... I forget the whole story there. But didn't that poor little kangaroo die in the meantime? I, th- I think uh, later on, I think there was yeah. uh, there, there was a thing. But I, uh, now this is going to sound really bad, but I do remember seeing pictures of Roger the kangaroo, thinking, "Oh yeah, if I was Did a girl kangaroo, I'd be in there." I always found it; it just seems so unnatural. But it it seems that they I know, but he they, was, they can they can become oh, like this. He yeah. was. Mm. What's that? Yeah, he was mm. very much so. Um, in 2009, <laughs> yeah, see, it does sound very bad. I fancy a kangaroo. Um, yeah. In 2019, a book written by Charlotte Bronte, aged 14, for her mm. toy soldiers, bought by the Bronte Society for 600,000 euros at an auction Ooh. in Paris. And in 2020, Michael B. Jordan is named the sexiest man alive by People magazine. Well, I have got to jump in here because most recently, 2021, 
Paul Rudd has been voted People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive. And I say People Magazine... There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on Instagram or whatever. People are going, huh? I don't get it. And other people, oh yes, totally. Yeah. And other people are thinking, Paul Rudd, really? Um, but yeah. okay. No offense. I, I, mean, like, I sure think he's lovely. He's lovely. He's adorable. But I mean, it's, look, it's a ridiculous uh, title anyway, isn't yes. it? Sexiest man alive or sexiest woman alive? Really? I mean, what are you supposed to do with that? I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's a sport. You know, you, you you grace the cover of the magazine and it goes on your resume. I mean, I you can't take it seriously. That's for sure. <laughs> Let's have a look at some birthdays. On this day in 1939, Margaret Atwood, the Canadian uh, author and uh, poet, was born. 1960, mm-hmm. Kim Wilde, English pop star, Kids in America, yeah. was born in London. <laughs> Uh, 1962, Kirk Hammett, the American heavy metal guitarist uh, of Metallica, was born in San Francisco, California. 1963, Peter Schmeichel, the Danish footballer, ah. was born. And finally, 1968, Owen Wilson, the American actor from Meet the Parents of Zoolander, was born in Dallas, Texas. And I believe you have a birthday announcement. Yes, I do. So I'm not sure if he's watching this evening, but he might watch the podcast or the replay. But I want to give advanced happy birthday wishes to my dearest dad, who will be celebrating his birthday on Monday next, the 22nd of November. Now, in normal life, Dave and I would have been traveling to Ireland tomorrow to be there for the weekend. But sadly, that didn't kind of work out at all. So we're hoping that we can still come and see you next month. But... We're waiting to see how things go. But in any case, exactly. In any case, wishing you already best wishes for Monday. And we'll be chatting on the day and expect one of my all famous uh, singing voicemails down the phone. So, uh, you know. (laughs) Well, happy birthday to Dad and happy (laughs) birthday to anybody else out there who is having a birthday today. Hope you're having a lovely time. And that was this day in history. Thank you very much. Very now, nice. of course, um, I'm just going to add there that if anybody else wants to have a singing happy birthday down the phone, Tracy <laughs> is open to offers. <laughs> happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, yes, it's it's, it's great fun, really. <laughs> and the, the saddest part is usually Dave gets roped in, so he's kind of humming in the background <laughs> in a very low monotone. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, yeah, it's really weird because... Um, you know, thinking about that it's now November and, you know, how funny you have all these best laid plans and then, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's uh, a bit the dust. Mm. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I suppose we better move on to the really nice news now. Then. Oh, great. Because <laughs> the news is so positive. Uplifting, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is great. It's all good stuff here today. Oh, God. All right. All right, then. Are you ready? Well, I suppose. (laughs) Well, we've got Laura coming up soon. Hurrah! Yay! (laughs) Tracy Taylor with the news. Thank you, Joanne. Good evening, everyone. It's November 18th, and you're watching the Maastricht edition on Facebook Live. First, to look at your weekend weather, and Friday will remain overcast with a chance of drizzle and highs of 11. Saturday will also be cloudy, but should remain dry, highs of 12. Sunday is set to bring rain and even the chance of hailstone, however. Temperatures will only reach 9 degrees. More wintry weather is set to be on the way towards the end of next week, bringing light frosts at night and the possibility possibility of snow showers. Moving to your bulletin for tonight and a roundup of local and domestic news. A new record of positive coronavirus tests was reported to the Public Health Institute RIVM this morning. It's the fourth day in a row that the number has increased. Hospital admissions in the Netherlands have also gone up with 413 people in intensive care. The surge in cases in the Netherlands means that the entire country is now dark red on the coronavirus map. This means other EU countries could now demand that travellers from the Netherlands go into quarantine upon arrival. But this has not yet happened. Here in Maastricht, 174 new coronavirus infections were reported on Monday, the highest number in a single day since the pandemic began in 2020. 
Staying with COVID and France has tightened entry requirements for travellers from the Netherlands due to the rising number of COVID infections. Unvaccinated travellers from the Netherlands must now be able to show a negative PCR test taken within 24 hours of their departure for France. The Netherlands has also started its coronavirus coronavirus booster vaccination campaign today with the over 80s and hospital staff first in line for the top up. The government had planned to roll out the campaign in December but brought it forward two weeks under pressure from MPs and healthcare experts. Everyone over the age of 60 will be invited for a booster jab as will those living in residential care and frontline staff. In other news tonight, Princess Amalia has accepted her future role as Queen of the Netherlands, though she does not yet know where her focus will be. Author Claudia de Bray has penned the book titled Amalia, which was published last Tuesday. In the book, the eldest daughter of King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima speaks about her future position, her hobbies, income, studies and faith. One person has died and several others have been hospitalized after an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in the Nord Brabant town of Schaendel. In total, 10 people, all aged 60 to 90, have been affected by the outbreak. The source has not yet been established. Royal Dutch Shell has announced that the company's headquarters, currently located in The Hague, will be moving to the United Kingdom. The oil and gas company has also revealed that its official name will be shortened to Shell. The move will see a handful of jobs also relocate from the Netherlands to London. And Andre Ryu has announced that he will be rescheduling three of his Christmas concerts at the Mech in Maastricht, which were due to take place on the 17th, 18th and 19th December. The reason is because of the continuing risky situation around COVID and Mr. Ryu felt it would be irresponsible to go ahead with the event. Tickets already purchased will remain valid for the new dates in December 2022. And finally tonight, a special mention for Mickey Mouse or Michael Theodore Mouse, who is 93 today. Mickey Mouse first appeared in the short film Steamboat Willie on November 18, 1928, and was the first cartoon character to earn a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And that's all, folks. For more local news, you can follow RTV News in English on Facebook and Instagram. If you are a local business, be sure to check out the Support Your Local Business South Limburg Facebook page, a joint initiative between Hashtag Maastricht and the Maastricht Edition. And if you want to discover events, concerts and cultural activities going on in Maastricht and the surrounding areas, head on over to the, the website of our partner, Restrictor.com. If a historical walking tour is more your thing, then check out Meet Maastricht, the key to your city. And finally, don't forget that you can always find us on the Master Tradition Facebook page, on YouTube, on Redbubble, and on Instagram. For all the details, check out the Master Tradition.nl. Nicely done now, Tracy. Lovely stuff. Theodore is uh, Mickey Mouse's middle name. A good pub quiz thing to know, Michael Theodore Mouse, shortened to Mickey Mouse. That is. That is that. Oh, that's very specialist knowledge. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Theodore. So you heard it here on TME. <laughs> oh my God, we teach you so much on this program. Really? Oh my God. Oh, pat on the back for ourselves, Joe. Go us. Absolutely. <laughs> Goodness me. Toilets, Theodore, Mickey Mouse's middle name. Honestly, it's just, we're so diverse. We really are. Okay, well, let's, let, let's keep it going because uh, I think it's probably time we uh, talked about bread beer. I think sustainable beer and farms and forests. Is good. Oh, there's so much going on. And here is Laura. Hello, Laura. Hello, good evening. Oh, it's so nice to see you again. How are you? I'm good. And how are you? We're great. Yeah. We, we, were, we were just discussing <laughs> that uh, we just found out that Mickey Mouse's middle name is Theodore. No way. <laughs> really? <It's> <laughs> yes, we didn't know. <laughs> That's such an interesting fact. I didn't know either. <laughs> you see, exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it baffles us, really. <laughs> uh, well, we, 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 we just amaze ourselves every week. The information that we actually give out to the whole of Maastricht exactly. every week, honestly. Okay. We, should, we should be part of somebody's thesis at uh, yeah. the university, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell things you can learn on this show. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'll tell you what we're going to learn um, is what's going over at Peak and Road Beer because, uh, oh my goodness, you have something exciting to tell us. However, yeah. before we get that far, let's remind everybody exactly what you guys get up to because um, I remember when you told us the first time my jaw dropped. I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. So let's remind everybody how brilliant you guys really are. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Great for this introduction. Yeah, indeed. So I think this is already a third time on the show and every time I have a new fun story to tell. Uh, yeah, so it all started in 2018 with the beer when I introduced a Pique Brot beer, which is a beer made with unsold bread. So collected from local shops and then we reduced the amount of malt in the beer and replace it with the unsold bread. And I think last time on the show, because of COVID, yeah, it's stuck at home. We got creative and we produced the gin out of unsold bread. So instead of a beer, yes. we went for slightly stronger alcoholic drink. So yeah, that's what I told, talked about last time. Again, the story with the bread continues. But now I have a slightly new story. It's sort of maybe related to the bread, as in it's a continuation of the sustainability mindset. But this time I matured, stepped away from bread and did something entirely different. <laughs> oh, I yeah. can't wait to hear this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the, the fun the fun story, um, this year, 2021, together with my family, we started a new business. We thought, you know, our name is Nibur, which technically in Dutch is part farmer. So we thought, you know what, let's get back to our roots and start a farm. How difficult can it be? I mean, people have been <laughs> doing it for centuries. <laughs> So, yeah, we, uh, as a family, we bought a farm here in the area, in the Ranzaal, which is near Falkenburg. Mm. And uh, it was a former dairy farm. And we decided to do forest farming. So we are planting five hectares of forest that will <gasps> produce, yeah, fruits, vegetables, nuts, leaves, flowers, everything mm. to your imagination that you That's can eat. That's huge! Yeah, <laughs> it's a big scale project this time. <laughs> Indeed, you yeah. must be getting some help because you're not going to be able to do this on your own. No, no, exactly. No, we're not doing this on our own. Also, our, our farm, our project is part of a national strategy to see if forest farming could be a viable alternative to our currently monoculture farming. Mm -hmm. As you probably also follow the news, you've seen the challenges around both for the environment, but also for human health. Yeah, the monoculture farming, it's, it's coming to an end. We need a bit more variation in the landscape. So this forest farming is now being introduced as a new alternative. And we're part of a national program, one of the testing farms to see if we can indeed make this into a, yeah, a viable transition, both for people, so for business, but also for the environment, nature, the animals, the soil. So we're getting some help from experts that know how to design this forest, because of course that is, you need to have so much knowledge about plants and yeah, you all know my background is more in beer and drinks, so I, I probably know 10 plants, so that's not really going to get us far. And we will have over, I think, 300 different uh, plants that will give fruits, vegetables, nuts, leaves, anything. So yeah, you need to know a lot. So they're helping us with the design, which is awesome. And we're having volunteers help us plant the trees because... Those are also plenty for. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, my mind is blown here totally because <laughs> when, when you think of a traditional farm, um, yeah. when you think of agriculture, then you know, basically you're just planting lots of seeds in a row and you're growing your, your, your uh, standard uh, foods of potatoes, yeah. carrots, uh, and such like, you know. Um, when you talk about forest, I'm thinking walking the dog on a Sunday afternoon through a forest. I'm not thinking about um, using everything within the forest to feed myself. I mean, to be honest with you, most of us are probably scared to pick anything off a tree or a bush in case we poison ourselves. So yeah. how does this work? Yeah, and I, I, that last point is definitely true. I always felt the same as well. I mean, you're surrounded with so many plants and yet we don't know what we can eat. We only know that we can eat a potato and these kind of vegetables. So mm. through this process, actually learning about forests and crops and how that kind of is a whole ecosystem of flora, fauna working together to produce food has really opened up my eyes. How, I mean, how far away we are from nature, how we put ourselves outside of it, how we become scared of it. Like you say, right, can I eat these things? Am I not going to poison myself? 
but it actually turns out a lot of things in nature are edible. It's mm -hmm. like a lot of things you can eat, just even common things um, that we don't really think about. Leaves from certain trees, trees that you mm -hmm. might actually see every day, you can eat. It's like the mm. first time that someone just picked a leaf from a tree and said you can eat this, I felt like, am I dreaming? Is this really mm. happening? Oh my goodness. Don't mm. learn these kind of things. But I think fundamental to the, the, yeah, the forest farming is that you uh, try to find a combination of different crops that work together to mm -hmm. kind of build a forest ecosystem. And in a forest ecosystem, nature is in balance, basically. So you don't have one crop overtaking everything like you would mm -hmm. have in a regular, let's say potato field, but you have a diversity of crops and that can naturally fight off any pests or even battle certain extreme weather conditions because there is mm -hmm. such balance. It's, it's basically, I would say, if you have a team of people, it's always best to have different skills in the team and not everyone have the same skill. I mean, mm. farming should maybe be compared to this as well. We need to have more diversity and the combination of crops and the environment that you create makes that you can yeah, harvest a lot of different plants that are up until now quite uncommon to us because we cannot grow them in the conventional farming where you just plant one crop continuously. Mm -hmm. I always really like the example of the pow pow and maybe some of your listeners actually know it because it's uh, originally from North America, that continent, mm -hmm. that climate. And the pow pow is very interesting because it's a tropical type of flavor to me it tastes a bit like a combination between banana and mango in one fruit yeah. but it grows in our climate so it's like a bit mind-blowing because you think oh. of tropical fruits as far away but it actually grows in our climate and it does best in like a foresty environment wow. so we can introduce these special crops again and yeah so you're not going to have to fear that we will only have walnuts and an apple. <laughs> it will be, I think, over a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, I have. Yeah, I have two remarks, if I may. Number one, I, I find it tragic that us as a human race have actually forgotten any knowledge we might have had about what you can eat from the leaves and the trees. Because back in the day, you, years ago, I mean, you just knew this and uh, you were aware and it, it was knowledge that was passed down and we were hunter-gatherers and foragers yeah. and, and yeah. living off the land. And, and how awful and embarrassing that we've all lost this knowledge, yeah. I guess. Um, and the, the second thing I think is certainly with the last two years with COVID, I feel, yeah. and I see it a lot on, on social media, that there is a huge turnaround now back to this type of living and mm -hmm. almost trying to backflop on <laughs> what we what we have come from maybe yeah. from 30 years ago and trying to think, okay, we had it pretty good back then. What the hell were we thinking? And to try to bring that back in again now, like with sustainable farming and, and replanting things that are native to the, yeah, to yeah. the soils here. It's like we're moving out of the cities. Yes, indeed. And uh, I mean, it, it's it really, I, I think back to my mother in, in her youth growing up. I mean, they lived off their own farm and everything was from their own farm. They grew it. They they killed it. I mean, everything was, was from yeah. their, their farm. Um, yeah. And it's... Uh, it's refreshing to see that there are some some good changes in this direction and and this is a very very nice example of of maybe how we should all be trying to live <laughs> i guess yeah, well, I, I guess also to that end right covid definitely opened our eyes we have a lot of good things in the world and we have developed in a positive way also but we have also developed in the wrong direction for some things and we need to reconfigure and recalibrate like COVID showed us as well, right? We reflected on some of the values that we had and how far we have moved on and what we really care for. And mm. I think this type of farming is that as well. It's still a concept in development. So yeah, it has been proven small scale. Um, actually, Martin Crawford from the UK is one of the most experienced uh, yeah, forest farmers in the world. So if you're interested in this topic, definitely Google his name. But in the Netherlands, we have Wouter van Eck, for example, near Nijmegen, and he has a forest farm that's already 10 years old. And it really shows the potential of what is possible. But now we need to see how it can indeed fit within our ecosystem of life. Mm. Uh, because I don't expect everyone to become a farmer again and indeed start to grow their own vegetables, which is also <laughs> okay. But it's good that we start to, you know, get more closer food chains so that the food 
doesn't come from super far away if we can grow exactly. such a variety of well, vitamins. I, I, I have to remind everybody, exactly. we did have Charlotte from the broth bar on here last oh. week <laughs> with her announcement of, oh, we're leaving the broth bar, we're going to go and live on a farm out in the country. So uh, I see a theme here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. There is this a connection there, yeah. <laughs> so, so long term, Laura, what, what's your vision then in sort of like 5, 10, 20 years time? Well, first of all, five years is going to be easy. Normally, this is a difficult question, but a forest takes up to five years before it even produces its first fruits. So okay. here's I'll still be around waiting for the farm and the forest to progress. And in the meantime, what we're trying to develop from a business perspective is to see how can a farmer bridge between year one and year five. So mm -hmm. what should we do? So what we have decided to do is we're doing organic farming of just yeah, general crops. So what they call one year crop, which is like a, a zucchini or a pumpkin, everything that you harvest and then the plant dies and you kind of need to start over yeah. again. So we're mm -hmm. going to do that on the side, but again, also organic with the same mindset as the forest. So inclusive to nature. Uh, so to follow certain practices that don't disrupt the environment as is. Uh, and then we'll probably continue with that because it's a good substitution for the products from yeah, the forest. Because like a potato, a potato is never going to grow in the forest. So if you yeah, want yeah. that, you still have to grow it on the side. And then we are we have converted or are in the process of converting the old barn and making a small scale food factory, you could say there, to process also part of the harvest so that we can make innovative new products and flavors, which oh, that's in line with the beer. So it's also I'm yeah. brewing my own beer then. Uh, so now that we've displayed the space and then yeah, hopefully integrate cool veggies, uh, fruits, herbs, anything from the farm. Mm. That's great. So I also invite people to definitely, if they have products or they're interested in something, to definitely reach out to us because I really want it to be more of a co-creation space Kind of in that sense that, yeah, sustainability is not done by one or an individual, but by sure. all of us together. Well, I was so. going to say, you were, you were asking them or saying that you're going to have volunteers um, uh, there. So these volunteers obviously are going to be learning on the job, as it were. So this is a perfect opportunity if people are thinking, do you know what? I wouldn't mind a little small holding lot mm -hmm. uh, hectares like you're going to have, but... <laughs> But, you know, even if it's just a little small holding where they've got a few chickens and they're growing a few fruits and vegetables and such like, this is a good opportunity to learn how to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also for us, right, to learn also because it's not like I am now an experienced farmer. I'm also in year one of the learning curve. Yeah. So it's always great to get into contact with people who are interested. And we also now, as of this week, have a small shop on the farm where we're selling some of the organic produce that we have and some of the products Lovely. that we make. So it's also just, I would encourage if you're interested to learn more about the forest farm and the process. And yeah, the forest is going to be there for the next 30 years. So that's yeah, yeah. With, or with, with or without me. So the forest is going to stay. So it's probably interesting for people to come and visit and to see it now while well, it's still mainly grassland and just mm. <laughs> small trees left and right to really see that progress as well how to make a forest out of a former grass field oh it's going to mm. be so much fun to watch the progress it really yeah. is <laughs> so, I think so if people want to come and volunteer um, what's the best way of getting hold of you well, they should probably go to our website. That's the best. Or follow us on social media and send a message there. So mm -hmm. the name of the farm is Luboschland, which I can imagine is a Dutch word. So for some people, maybe complicated. But maybe if you do the post that you always do at the end, then we can share the website name there. So then mm -hmm. excellent. Find it. We'll yeah. do that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, I, t uh, I, I know Tracy feels exactly the same. We wish you so much luck with this. This is, this is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I, and, uh, I think actually, uh, uh, Tracy, this could be uh, a team day out, actually. Yeah, oh, sure. also, Dan, it's, welcome. Out, yeah. it's, it's outdoors, it's uh, nature stuff. It's, all it's not going to be until next summer, though, I tell you that. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed, and be careful, because apparently it's going to be frosty next week in the night, so uh, look after the crops. <laughs> yeah, yes. we'll do okay. so. Thanks so much. Thanks again for having me, and have a good, uh, good rest of the show and hopefully next time I can surprise you with another progress update. Oh, we, we can't wait. We can't yeah. wait. It's absolutely brilliant. Thanks ever so much for joining us, Laura. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.
Oh my goodness! Everybody's leaving the city. It's maybe it's time I left as well. Maybe it, maybe it's a theme. <laughs> Stay tuned, Joe. Next week, the rural edition. Well, I have to say, I feel maybe I've been an inspiration here. You know, living out yeah. in, the, in the country with the goats. Ah. But, <laughs> but I tell you what she was saying about um, zucchinis or courgettes, as they're, as, as they're also known. If anybody ever asked me what, what is the uh, to get started in growing vegetables, mm -hmm. which is the best one to start with, I always say. Uh, courgettes or zucchinis because they are so easy to grow and you will get stacks and stacks of them from one plant and even if you don't eat that many of them you know you can make fantastic soup and shove it in the mm -hmm. freezer it's just oh they're, I, they're a brilliant crop I love a courgette actually one of oh, my favorites in fact courgettes really very versatile very very Kish. good to you very good quiches or even just you mm. know when you fry them off with a bit of um, oregano yeah. or oregano um, yeah. that you can have on the side but it's really good actually the other night Dave and I had um I think it's called courgette which is a new thing yes. now where they've made strips of uh, courgette yes. it's, oh, it's lovely. so uh, very nice it's an alternative very nice. so uh, yes, like very, very versatile nice. crop yeah yes. but very, it's really cool but it's um it's it's not just the romance uh, that you you look into with this kind of a lifestyle it's also quite hard work farming is, it is. it's a tough it's a tough gig you know um yes. but lots and lots of luck and always good to be repopulating forests that gets sure. a big thumbs up Absolutely. and as a and as a forest lover myself i i enjoy walk in the forest from time to time um i'd be curious to see what kind of mushrooms might grow up <laughs> it could be quite nice i've always been out. wary with with mushrooms Ooh, i love yes. a mushroom but i'm always sort of like oh I, I, no i'm not sure about it and i always back off i always yeah. back off. But, uh, that's where we, we've lost the knowledge but in any case they're yes. great to they're great to photograph <laughs> this is true and now i'll tell you what else is great to photograph is the lovely lucy from uh, meet maastricht Absolutely. she is so photogenic in fact we've got a video of her right now telling us about something very interesting in the center of maastricht Absolutely. <laughs> Hello. For your weekly five minutes of history and heritage of Maastricht, today I thought I'd talk about the Vogelstruis. That's a sort of backwards way of saying ostrich in Dutch. The contemporary word is struis, vogel. So, uh, Vogelstruis is backwards. It's, um, however that may be, it is the name of a legendary pub at the Vredhof. If you live in this city, um, you can't have missed it, really. Uh, and of course, it has a large stone depicting an ostrich over the door. Um, it has been part of uh, uh, Maastricht lore and uh, traditions, especially those around uh, Carnival, for decades and decades. And it seems most local people think it's always been there. That is not really the case. Um, uh, to begin with, because uh, uh, the, the present idea of, of uh, a cafe in the, in, the, in the way we use it here uh, is, is fairly recent. They uh, they really grew out of the uh, the coffee houses, hence café, coffee in French, um, of the of the eighteenth century, where the citizenry would uh, would gather in uh, salon like places and discuss politics and current affairs and revolution and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and the name stuck, but the institution changed dramatically in the in the decades since. Uh, because uh, we now associate the word café not with coffee but with beer. They are uh, they are the watering holes of the of the city, and everybody can take their pick of the ones they prefer. And of course, over the years, they've also become more and more uh, eateries. You know, uh, sort of bistro type uh, fare on. Uh, which will be on offer but that of course is gruesome to people who remember the olden days where maybe you could get a hard-boiled egg and that was it okay those days are long gone as you may have noticed 
uh, very original cafes are also not prevalent in the city anymore, as you may have noticed. There's this, um, of course, the, 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 the general fashions of the day uh, all have reached Maastricht as well. And you will find uh, bars, cafes, eateries in an uh, enormous variety all around the place. Um, the Vogelstrauss so, uh, bravely uh, keeps up with the times, um, but the, the building uh, had always been used for different purposes. It was, it was a family home and uh, uh, most of these family homes may have had some kind of commercial activity going on on the, on the ground floor of their houses. Uh, and on the other hand, there would have been many, many private houses where some sort of, of, of liquor was being served before all of that was, uh, was strictly regulated. Um, so there's there's some there's some fluidity there as you can uh, as you can imagine not just in the glasses. The the um, proprietors of the Vogelstrauss have always been central in organizing um, what you may call the invented traditions of Maastricht. They have uh, they have always participated in. Uh, the, the large-scale celebrations of, uh, of Carnival, they'll have a big stage out front. Um, they have always been part of uh, thinking of uh, happy stuff to, uh, to entertain the citizenry. And uh, quite a bit of this has, has uh, uh, started in the middle of the 19th century, when uh, a large part of Maastricht was uh, desperately poor. And a small part of Maastricht was uh, well off, and they uh, decided they needed to um, cheer people up a bit and take care of some charity to alleviate their lot just a little. In a modern shape, that is how, uh, from the Vogelstrauss, there's a committee working to have the enormous proevenement on the Vreethof, right in front of them every year. Proeven de Meent is an event where you can go proeven, sample, have a taste of all kinds of culinary delights. It is a, it is a eating and drinking festival on the Vreethof and the Vogelstrauss has been, the people of the Vogelstrauss have been instrumental in getting that up and running. Uh, it's the summer's conclusion in Maastricht. Look for it next year. Lucy, the lovely Lucy from Meet Maastricht there. Oh. Okay, well, we are so close to the end of the show now. Oh. We've run out of time almost. So, Tracy. But, yes. Titty bitties. Yes. I, what have I, you got? I've got, first of all, Tracy's tasty titty bitty for this week is the India House on the Breda Strat in Maastricht. Dave and I did a takeout from there uh, last week or the week before, sometime recently. It's really good. Very authentic flavours. A little more pricey maybe than what you might pay for regular takeout, but so worth it. Papa Dom's naan bread, nice curries, spicy, soft, creamy, all really good. I have two other things for you. I'm going to read this out. I prepared it earlier. I want to give a shout well, we want to give a shout out to Grow, which is a new concept space and pop-up store on the Rexstraat number 79 in Maastricht. Now this offers sustainable products, again sustainable, we like that, from local designers, which is really very cool. Now we heard about this from the lovely Iris Desiree Classens, and we are thrilled that she brought the initiative to our attention. Now the store is open from 19th November, which is tomorrow, until, oh, yes. until 31st of December, from Thursday to Saturday, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And you can find out more by the website irisdesireeclassons.com and on Instagram. We'll post it in the show, uh, post show post later. So why not pop by and check out a local and sustainable alternative to the festive holidays. Nice. Now, staying with the festive theme, see what I did Ooh, here? 
if, if you've already always wanted to learn some Christmas carols, well, now is your chance because singer and vocal coach Igita, one of our uh, guests on the show uh, in the past years, is offering three mini workshops on December 2nd, 9th and 16th from 4 p.m. to 5.15 p.m. You will learn three different Christmas carols, warming up exercises, and the basics of health singing. Ooh. Now, you need to have a valid COVID pass, obviously, to get inside to the little cozy room. Uh, it costs 75 euros per person, but if you uh, sign up early, you only pay 65 euros. So if you're, uh, if this is something uh, that you might be interested in, why not check it out or have a look at our post show post for all the details. And a partridge in a pear tree. Oh, lovely. Oh, that sounds like a very nice idea. Okay, well, we have to stop. We have to stop. Yes, I know. <laughs> Next week, let's start with the carols. One a week until Christmas. <laughs> She's yeah, going to make me do this. She is. <laughs> well, you never know. Definitely once December comes. So uh, you might be all right because next week we're still in November. So uh, we'll be all right. But yeah, getting getting towards the end of the year. Goodness. Uh, yeah. And, and just because the world is possibly coming to a grinding halt doesn't mean we can't celebrate Christmas. We'll do it on here if we don't do it anywhere at all. So absolutely. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Well, it's been lovely uh, this evening having Laura on, on the show um, telling us all about the new sustainable forest that is going up just outside of the city. I mean, it's, it's quite astonishing. And yes. um, we shall be back again next week. Thank you very yes. much for joining us. Um, I hope you've had a good time. Tell us all about it. Send us some messages. We will be back next Thursday. Uh, watch that frost that is coming up uh, in, yes. in the coming week. <laughs> Keep your eye on um, RTB News in English as well for all the latest updates as far as the restrictions that are coming in and out, in and out, in and out. We can't keep up with it, I'm, I swear. <laughs> well, have a lovely weekend, whatever it is you're doing, and we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks ever so Yay. much. Bye for Bye. now. Bye.